Okay. Um, and then I want to start out with uh, just a super simple icebreaker. I, I learned this from Trish yesterday. Um, it's the one word chat icebreaker. Um, so what I'd like you to do, I'm going to give you 20 seconds to do it, um, to think about this, and then I want everybody to post your answer at the same time in the chat. So don't post it right away. Um, wait until I say post it. Um, and it's one word. Um, Trish had us uh, think about what we wanted out of that day's meeting. What I'm going to ask you is, uh, how did I frame it? Oh, what is one quality that really inspires you in a leader or causes you to think of someone as a leader? So we're honoring and, um, and celebrating uh, five extraordinary leaders in the field today. So what is a quality that, that you see in leaders or that leads you to think of someone as a leader? So take a few seconds, formulate your answer, get your chat ready, and then I'll tell you when to post it. Okay, go ahead and post your answers. Oh, these are wonderful. Look at this. We have uh, persistence, brave, compassion, dedication, integrity, good listener, passionate, inspiring, another integrity, clear vision for the future, many words, but good sentiment, trust, empathy, humility, respect for others, integrity, empathy, creativity, empathy, leading from behind, patience, authenticity, compelling humility, empathy, tenacity, love for humanity, steadfastness, generosity, and integrity. Fantastic, those are great. Um, okay, thank you so much for that. Um, that's a really good way to start this meeting. Um, before I present our first award, I would like to announce the winners of our student poster contest. So each year the section runs a student poster contest. Students um, present scientific posters. They, they deliver their poster and then they also answer questions about it. This year that was done virtually um, at the end of last week. Um, and the posters are still up along with video comments from the presenters. And our winner of the first place uh, poster award goes to Tracy Lamb Hine. Um, and our second place poster winner is Saima Hanan. So um, congratulations to Tracy and Simon. Um, and if the two of you could uh, wave your hands right now. Turn on your camera and wave. Oh, congratulations. There you are. Thank you both for submitting your posters and congratulations for winning the, the, the prize on those. Um, and thanks for joining the luncheon. Lovely, lovely to have you here. Okay. Um, so now, uh, without further ado, I would like to present the first of our awards, which is uh, the Rebecca A. Head Award, and this is being presented to Michelle Oko. Um, the award recognizes an outstanding emerging leader working at the nexus of science, policy, and environmental justice. Uh, Michelle's work focuses primarily on environmental justice, administrative law, and public health law. Her research interests lie at the intersection of environmental justice and public health. She draws upon theories across disciplines in addressing legal issues and views environmental justice through a health equity lens. Her health equity approach orients her scholarship and demonstrating that environmental justice and health equity are achievable. So um, congratulations, Michelle. It, it is the section's great honor to award you the Rebecca A. Head Award. And now I'd like to turn over to you for a few remarks. Yes, um, thank you so much for honoring me with this um, award. I was very honored and surprised. Um, and uh, this is my work with APHA has been so fulfilling. Um, I love the dedicated people of APHA. I mean, 
Wow. Um, as far as kind of environmental justice, I think the work that we do can be very frustrating. And a lot of times it could feel that we're not making progress. But one of the great things about um, working, you know, in the environmental justice committee and then with the environment section overall, we are so solution focused. And we really do believe that environmental justice is achievable. It may not be tomorrow, but, um, but over time, we as advocates can work together and make progress. And one day we can address these issues. So I'm very proud to be receiving this award and thank you for honoring me. Um, thank you for working alongside me. Wonderful. Congratulations. Okay. Um, our next award goes to another um, section member, and this is the Distinguished Service. Oh, sorry, let me unspotlight you um, so that we can see everybody again. Um, uh, so our next award goes is the Distinguished Service Award, and the Distinguished Service Award is presented to Josna Jagai. Um, so Josna is the recipient of this award in recognition of her significant contribution to and service to the environment section. Josna has actively served in the section since she was a student and has led in many roles, including section counselor, co-program planner, um, membership chair, and also chair just before me. Throughout, her focus has been on students and early career professionals, including first seeking out the grant that enabled our section to award conference membership, uh, conference and membership scholarships to students. Um, and that grant, we've continued to pursue that grant and, and award uh, student scholarships. She continues her engagement at APHA currently by bringing issues of the environment to the APHA Science Board and review of APHA policies. Um, so I've had the personal pleasure to work with Josna um, very closely over the last couple of years uh, because I was chair elect while she was serving as chair. And it's just been a, an extraordinary honor and privilege to get to work with her so closely. So um, with that, I'd like to congratulate Josna for this award and turn the floor over to Josna to hear a few words from you. Thank you so much, Jenny, and the section. This is really just such an incredible honor, and I'm completely humbled because this recognition is coming from peers and colleagues, which is just so special and um, meaningful to me. I've been engaged in the section since um, I was a student. I my, I will remember my first APHA, I felt completely overwhelmed with no idea where to go and what to do and was running across the convention center like a crazy person, um, trying to attend sessions in all sections back to back. Um, but I attended an APHA, um, an environment section session and was people were talking afterwards and engaging me and engaging all the students in the room and not making me feel like, you know, I wasn't supposed to be there as a student. And soon enough, I was at the luncheon, which was not yet called the Rebecca Head Luncheon. And I actually honestly think it was Rebecca Head who pulled me to the Calver Luncheon and said, all students should be here, everyone should be here. Um, and have been roped in ever since and can't extricate myself from the section. So um, I think in the work that I've done with this section, I think students have really, I've tried to make, put things in place for students and early career professionals because um, I think, as I said, that's how I got roped in. And so hopefully we are able to use those tools and some of the things that we've put in place to get the section even more engaged and with students and early career professionals because that's how we can build and grow and get some new ideas in the section. So thank you all so much. It's really a true honor. Thank you, Josna, and thank you for everything that you've done for the section and, and also for APHA more broadly. Um, this really is such a well-deserved award. Um, so it's a pleasure, it's, it's a huge pleasure to work with you. Okay, um, 
let's see. Now we move on to the Damu Smith Award. Um, this year, the Damu Smith Award is being presented to two people, Omega and Brenda Wilson. So they're the recipients of the Damu Smith Award in recognition of their tireless work for environmental justice in their community and nationally. Starting in 1994, they co-founded the West End Revitalization Association, or WIRA, and have been advocating for basic public health amenities for marginalized communities in North Carolina and the Southeast region of the US. Wera was awarded the US EPA's, in, oh, I am so sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Natalie, I was meant to turn over to you at this point. <laughs> you're okay, you're uh, okay. We all want to honor uh, Brenda and Omega. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're very enthusiastic about um, awarding this award. My apologies, Natalie, over to you. No, you're okay. So I think Jenny was just about to list off and we can't even fit in all of the accomplishments of Weira and the Wilsons. And I believe um, a couple of their sons are on the line here too. So I think it's a full family affair. Um, and as Jenny noted, you know, this is the first time it's gone to two people and it's so appropriate. Um, Omega quickly acknowledged that this was not his work alone. And so, um, it's just really great to have have everybody here. So I just wanted to say a couple of um, personal comments, maybe because I've gotten a chance to work with Omega over the last few years um, a bit more closely. And so, you know, I was gonna say that these two, you, we threw up all those words about what it means to be a leader. And I just, I think these two embody that to a T. Um, they truly are visionaries. I don't know, I really don't think I know anyone who is so committed to their community and environmental justice. Um, they go from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to community meeting to Zoom meeting to NIHS meeting to APHA, moving us all along with them. And I think, um, you know, what's beautiful about the the couple, the pair here is, you know, I know Omega is is brilliant in um, sort of holding us all very accountable, candidly sometimes, but also um, being patient and bringing us along with him. Meanwhile, um, Brenda is is quiet, but holds our ground. She, she keeps that foundation. And I think um, her brilliance comes through in quieter ways, but it's there. And so it's it's exciting in the, the few interactions I've had with your family too, to see that, you know, those values and that legacy is, is a whole family affair. So we're just really, really honored to have you here today. Um, if I could jump through the Zoom screen and hug you, I would. Um, but before we hand it off to you to share a few words, I want to um, actually um, bring on, we have, I believe, a couple of family members from Damu's Nikki. family, yeah. Damu Smith's niece. So um, yeah, I'm going to hand it off to you, Nikki. Wonderful. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations, uh, certainly to Brenda and Omega. I am so proud of you all. Um, just to give a, a brief background about Damu, because uh, we don't know who he is. Damu, my uncle, was an environmental activist from St. Louis, Missouri. And he was just an activist for pretty much most of his life. He was an activist in college. His first job that, that he took had to do with activism, with civil rights, with human rights. He, I remember him working in the, the anti-apartheid uh, justice fight. And then from there, he went into environmental justice. And, and that's where he remained to his last day. He, Damu passed away from cancer in 2006. But the, the issues that he fought are still with us. And that's why I'm so happy today to see everyone here and to, to just hear about these stories every year. I'm just happy to hear about the people continuing and continue with the work, the issues that Damu wanted to highlight. So I thank you all for, for doing that. I thank you for your work. I thank you for standing up for your country, standing up for your community, standing up for everyone, for all of us, for all Americans. And one, one quote that I will share with you all from Damu is that he said, we can have environmental justice and positive economic development that generates jobs for communities. And, but at the same time, that can also foster a cleaner environment. He always wanted to stress that those are not mutually exclusive. And we just have to remember that. I think we all know that here and we just have to keep spreading the word. So thank you again, congratulations to this year's winners and uh, I'll see you next year. Thank you.
Thank you, Nikki, for carrying those words forward and, and representing Damu. So we're going to turn it over to the Wilsons and hear from them now. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, this is a supreme pleasure to be here with everyone. And the honor is uh, just unspeakable. I had a chance to hear a lot about Damu. I never met him. Some people think I have. I've never met him. But I met so many other people who were at the Environmental Summit and 30 years ago. And uh, we we're honored to also to provide memorial memories, my wife and I are preparing those now on uh, the 28th at seven o'clock. Uh, it's a virtual and hopefully everybody here will be on along with a lot of other people. So uh, it's a great honor and it's a great privilege to provide a memorial, memorial notes along with the United Church of Christ, for so many of the people, along with Dominic, who were part of the uh, that groundbreaking uh, summit in, that was held in Washington, D.C. 30 years ago this month. My first contact with APHA came through some students at the School of Public Health at Chapel Hill. And they were energetic students and had not finished their master's and PhD degrees, but wanted to work with us. They're all, that's Chapel Hill is only 20 minutes from where we are sitting. And some of them became pretty significant contributors to APHA. Uh, one of those students was Dr. Shakobi Wilson, who's an associate professor now at the University of Maryland at College Park. Another was uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Haney, who's associate professor at John Hopkins University. Another was uh, John Cooper, who is now assistant vice president in urban studies at uh, Texas A&M. And there's so many, so many more that were students who wanted to help us collect data, what we call community science now. And some of the giant posters we produced for APHA uh, are hanging on our wall. Seven foot posters, there's three or four of them. And one is hanging on our wall. We can see it right from where we're sitting. It's been up there for several years. Mm -hmm. it, told, it tells the story about a lot of the issues we deal with re re relative to denial of safe drinking water and sewer services to black and brown communities uh, and the redlining of health infrastructure uh, that we filed a complaint about with the United States Department of Justice in 1999. Denial of basic amenities due to a pattern of historic uh, discrimination based on a revisionist political government. That's what they told us in, 1990, in 1994. And then the complaint was filed in 1999. So the giant posters are right now are going to be boxed and displayed at Duke University's archives. It's one of the largest archives in, at the university level. So uh, we've been in contact with them for quite a while. They will archive a lot of our information, including the APHA posters right, uh, that we have. And some of these posters have traveled with some of our student colleagues who are now professors now, the ones we mentioned before, they've taken these posters at different times of conferences in various places from San Francisco to Houston, to Vancouver, you know, Victoria University in Vancouver, Toronto, Canada, Florida, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Arlington, Virginia, uh, and Atlanta, Georgia, and in so many other places. So we appreciate the opportunity to be on it. We appreciate the opportunity to still be here to share some comments with you. My wife is going <laughs> to, she's saying I'm talking too long. She's going to talk no, about it. <laughs> you don't find it. <laughs> I'd just like to thank everyone. This is such a great honor to receive this award. Um, we've been doing this all our lives ever since we were little kids. And it's a, a honor to be here. Um, we're still together for 47 years. And um, 
71 years old, we'll be 72 years old next year. So the Lord has really helped us to continue to do the work that we need to do here in our community here in Mebane and other communities throughout uh, North Carolina, even throughout the United States. I'd like to mention two people who are not here, um, Marilyn Snipes and Dee Snipes. They were also founders of WIRA. Um, they're gone on now, but without their help and dedication and honor and uh, intensity um, to help our community and do what we need to do, um, we wouldn't be able to do it without them. And I also like to honor my sons, my three sons and my daughter-in-law for also helping us out and encouraging us and giving us words of, of uh, enthusiasm and comfort and telling us that we're on the right track. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for nominating us for this award. It means so much to us and to myself. Um, I really <laughs> appreciate my husband including me into this uh, this award because he he really is the the one who does all the talking. But I'm back there in the background urging him on and telling him you know what he should say, what he should say. But anyway, <laughs> I appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you know we um, we have a little bit of time, and I think it would be nice for people to get to ask you uh, questions or make a, a, a remark in response. Is there anybody who'd like to say anything right now or ask a question of our Damu Smith? Hi, well, this is this is Nikki. Uh, you all said mentioned Atlanta. That's where I am. Uh, what, what did you say about Atlanta? I, I said that Atlanta was one of the places we traveled to to share information at the Foresight Building, EPA. Uh, mm -hmm. We have been traveling back and forth to the Foresight Building, which is in downtown, the federal building, uh, okay. for several years now, mm -hmm. uh, for almost 20 years. Uh, in addition to the West Wing and the White House, uh, in addition to so many other uh, other places, but that's one of the places that we, we set foot on many, many, many occasions at, the, at the request of EPA. And of course, we've uh, done other presentations for the United States Department of Justice. Uh, and we, we most recently, our son Io is on. Uh, I, I think uh, Amori is also on. Amori is an attorney. Io is our director for clean energy and climate justice for us most recently. But we've most recently been asked to provide input to the United States Department of Justice only a few weeks ago. It was on the 1st of October, as a matter of fact about how to develop an environmental justice division for the Department of Justice uh, to uh, facilitate more environmental justice complaints. We filed a complaint in 1999 and got some positive results out of it when there was no environmental justice division. So now they reached back to us to say, hey, um, what do you think about how we should structure an environmental justice division for the whole Department of Justice for the United States. That's pretty interesting. We had to fight our way in, and now the Department of Justice is reaching back to ask us for advice about how to establish it so that everybody can access a more legal way of remedy for black and brown indigenous communities. Uh, that was That's pretty interesting. We're just glad we live long enough to see that kind of reach back from the United States Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, um, I wanna draw people's attention to some of the congratulatory remarks in the chat. And then also note that um, uh, your, your son Omari said, my parents make a great team. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like like he's quite proud of you. Um, Vincent Martin, you wanted to say I O also or say said something. I O, uh, their other uh, child also said congratulations. Uh, congratulations, mom and dad from Ayo, Holly, and Zeke. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it seems your your sons, your your children are, are very proud of you. Um, uh, Vincent Martin. Yeah. Yes, uh, Brenda Omega. First of all. Thank you for bringing me in into your family and representing We're North here in Detroit. 
because of, <laughs> you know, me and, me and Omega, we have met over 15 years ago at a conference and he has taken me under his wing and elevated my stance in environmental justice and what it means to be a true environmental justice warrior. And I just wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And because of the work that y'all two have done, I think environmental justice will go places for improvement of the world. Thank you. Thanks for those remarks, Vincent. Um, Sharon Beard, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm Sharon Beard uh, with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And I wanted to say, uh, Omega and Brenda, thank you again. It seems like I'm always thanking you for one thing or another, but it is absolutely well warranted because of the great work that you've done uh, to support your communities. And then also to just work with federal agencies. You have uh, really kept your, 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 your pressure up on us to make sure that we do what we're supposed to do that we change how we think, how we process information about how communities are impacted by hazardous materials, waste, uh, how we actually engage to provide you with the information that is needed for you to develop the best response that you can to share what the impacts are uh, on communities, uh, EJ communities across the United States. And so, and then also I wanted to say thank you for your uh, you know, upcoming participation and our uh, uh, addressing racism as a public health issue um, uh, workshop uh, through the lens of environmental health disparities and environmental justice, because you and uh, Naima Muhammad have really been working uh, to really help us to bring the community side to the table. And uh, we look forward to continuing our engagement and involvement on these issues. And we want to say congratulations on behalf of everyone that works uh, here at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences for your continued engagement and involvement in these efforts. So thank you again. Um, yeah, Layla. Um, thank you so much for your leadership and you have really shown us the way and uh, you know inspired so many of us. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what would you say to young people today who deeply care about environmental justice, but don't know where to start, how to start? Well, some of the young people are, are awardees, like uh, attorney <laughs> Michelle Oko, who is right here with us. Uh, she's a lecturer at Duke University's Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. So when we start talking about young people, anybody younger than 71 now is young people to us. But I think one of the things <laughs> is um, the language has changed. Uh, over a period of time, it was this question of discrimination against people of color. It was civil rights. It was women's rights. Uh, it was gender rights. Uh, it was environmental justice. It keeps evolving. And of course, a lot of the younger people we uh, communicate with um, want things in a pretty quick fashion. The Duke University project we mentioned earlier over there planning to archives a lot of our physical documents, uh, hundreds, thousands of them, posters, maps, all this stuff. Uh, we had the opportunity to have a young man, his name is Lucas Thornton. He's a senior at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's planning on going to environmental law as a result of doing an internship for us, <laughs> with us this past summer. Uh, he was a intern uh, at the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is an archivist, uh, is an archive at Chapel Hill. And he did two years there and he wanted to continue that on the ground. So we invited him here. Zisha Reynolds paid for his internship with us. So he wanted to look us, at us up close and personal. And I'll put a link in in a minute, in a second. Of the archives, he digitize a lot of our information because a lot of young people do not want to read all these giant documents we have, these binder documents, three, four, five hundred pages of physical things that we sent to the Department of Justice and EPA. They want to be able to click and click and click and click and click and zoom and enlarge and search. So 
he created a archives for us uh, based on what he thought a lot of young people his age and younger would like to see. And a lot of that is, is, is menu driven. Uh, you can look at it by cell phone or by laptop, computer, whatever. And that was just recently done. It was funded by the Zeeshman Reynolds, Reynolds Foundation out of Winston-Salem, which is our oldest funder going all the way back to 1997. So uh, that will give people an eye, younger eyes, as a way of looking at it. And they don't have to drag the books around. Uh, they can zoom on their telephones or on the tablets or wherever they are. And they can come back and pick up information or share information uh, as a part of the menu that's in there for them to look at. So that was one of the ways our, 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 our outreach. And of course, we're going to do the, the hard, musty files of, of archives, uh, some old documents that will be uh, stored that you have to walk in and access, you know, touch with rubber gloves and all this kind of stuff. We're in the process of figuring out how all that's going to work based on our files. So, but we, we knew that we had to reach out to a younger generation and uh, Lucas has helped do that. And as a result of him doing that, Lucas decided to change <laughs> the direction of his career mm -hmm. to be an environmental lawyer mm -hmm. as a result of doing that with us. So that that's that's one way, certainly one way. Yeah, we'll take one more comment or question, Michelle. Yeah, and I guess um, my my comment is actually closely aligned with um, with Layla's question, and I did want to say thank you to both. Um, Brenda and Omega for being, you know, an inspiration to me and all um, up and coming environmental justice advocates, um, you know, because we, I guess one thing is we bring up, you know, that you all were doing this work during the 90s to conceptualize that, you know, environmental justice was not on the main agenda as it is now. Um, and for those of us who were, who are and were up and coming um, environmental justice professionals, it is a very frustrating world to live in, not only because of policy, but also because of frustration as far as support from the environmental community itself. But um, both you, both of you have served as an anchor for us during those frustrations. And I appreciate you all always being there for when I do have those frustrations, being willing to listen to me, to guide me, having somewhere to go when I have those questions um, means the world to me. Um, and I know means the world to so many other people. And there are so many, there are so many um, environmental justice professionals that we could bring up today who are doing the work that we are doing because of the inspiration that you all inspired. So thank you. So Brenda and Omega, any, any final words from the two of you? As you can see, we've been in this for 30 some odd years now. So it takes a lot of patience. 42, sometimes you just want to throw up your hands and holler and walk away and just say, forget it. I'm not doing this anymore. But you can't do that because you're not the only one who is depending on you. You have others who are depending on you. And you have to be their voice. Sometimes you have people, a neighborhood people or communities who don't have a voice. So you can be their voice. So I say, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Um, you may not get the uh, um, appreciation right now, but it's coming. It's coming. So keep doing what you're doing. Again, I appreciate all the accolades and the warm wishes. Um, just keep thinking about us and so we can keep on and keep doing this another, hopefully uh, 10, 15, 20 years. We might move a little slow, but we'll, we'll be able to still do something. So I appreciate you. Thank you again. I, I don't think there's much I need to say after that. Just <laughs> uh, uh, consistency and persistency. Yeah. Uh, being persistent is important. And some people refer to us as 
old people, some refer to us as elders. Some people will start referring to us as sages. As, as sages. So I guess we'll take all that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Natalie, did you want to say any anything more? Just keep absorbing it, everyone who's here. I saw something <laughs> in the chat who's uh, a newbie, and I love that this was the first uh, entry to our section because it's just a powerful way to... Um, yeah, to, to learn about these things. So thank you, thank you, thank you for hanging with us. And uh, I look forward to the work continuing. Thank you so much. Okay, we're now going to move on to our next award, next and final awardee. Um, so this is the Homer Calver Award, and traditionally the Homer Calver Award and Lecture. Um, and this year's, uh, instead of a lecture, our awardee has opted to have a dialogue, so we'll be treated to a conversation. Um, and so our awardee is Tracy Woodruff. Um, and she is the recipient of the Homer Calver Award, which recognizes an environmental health expert, usually of national renown, who has contributed significantly to the field. Dr. Woodruff is a professor at the UCSF Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. She is a recognized expert on environmental pollution exposures and impacts on health, with a focus on pregnancy, infancy, and childhood and her innovations in translating and communicating scientific findings for clinical and policy audiences. Before joining UCSF, Dr. Woodruff was a senior scientist and policy advisor for the US EPA's Office of Policy. She was appointed by the governor of California in 2012 to the Scientific Advisory Board of the Developmental and Reproductive Toxicant Identification Committee. So uh, now it is my pleasure to congratulate Dr. Woodruff, Tracy Woodruff. Congratulations so much from the section um, for your extraordinary work and contribution. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to turn over to uh, Tracy and Trish Komen from our section, who will be her interlocutor. And Trish is quite distinguished in her own right. And indeed, last year, we honored her with the Distinguished Service Award for her work in the section. Um, but her work goes far beyond that. So looking forward to this conversation. Um, over to Trish and Tracy. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so I am so delighted to be able to um, have this conversation with my, my great friend and colleague, uh, Tracy Woodruff. So the Homer N. Calver Award and Lecture honors an environmental health leader contributing significantly to the field. Um, he served in the Army Sanitation Corps in France in World War I and as a health professional in North Carolina, so the North Carolina tradition here after the war. He was also APHA's first executive secretary and the editor of the American Journal of Public Health. So it's so great that we um, are honoring um, a, a fellow scholar um, with Professor Woodruff. Um, Homer Calver was also an engineer who built tools for our field, both technical methods and also ways to communicate and express the importance of health. And Tracy, your training as an engineer and an epidemiologist led you to be data and results driven as well. And when I first met you, uh, we worked at the US EPA together working on an air pollution standard and we were desperate for an epidemiologist with your stature and training. So, you know, tell us a little bit as you think back uh, briefly about how you got into this work and where you find your inspiration. Well, thank you, Trish, and thank you, because I think you secretly were behind this award. So I really appreciate, um, just so people know on the phone, we have known each other many years, though according to Omega and Brenda, we're still youngsters. Um, <laughs> but I just want to also thank them for their award and presentation because I was listening to them speak about the first environmental justice summit and thinking back Trish you and I met when I first went to EPA it was after the environmental justice but in the mid 90s but um, I went to EPA because um, as you said I do have an engineering background but when I was in school and this is an ad to talk to everybody you know that you can including at this section I had a colleague who told me that they were getting 
going to learn about epidemiology and public health. And I did not know anything about that. That's when I was in graduate school. And I thought, ooh, I really want to do something that has to do with humans. So because I was in engineering, but I really wanted to do something that helped people. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go to this epidemiology class. And then I thought, oh, maybe I could also go learn about public health. And I have to say it was so inspiring because public health is really all about creating systemic solutions to, to help everybody at the same time and to especially those that are most vulnerable. Because I mean, really, if you think about sanitation, which probably maybe we don't really think about, except when we flush our toilet, which is like, that was like an amazing, it's not an invention. Well, I guess it was an invention. But the fact that, you know, before we had toilets, people were sick with something else, with infectious diseases. And by putting in all this modern infrastructure, it really solved this infectious disease problem. So I feel like that was kind of something I was really, wow, what if we could use our technical knowledge and science to do something that could really help um, help the public. And so uh, that's why I went, to, I didn't really have any other great, brilliant ideas about what exactly I was gonna do before I went to EPA, but I just thought, well, EPA is a place that can create systemic solutions to address environmental pollution, which I knew was really impacting health. And, and I just would say, we know so much more since I went there, but also what was really, amazing when I first went to EPA was, was in the Clinton administration. And while the, the National Environmental Justice Summit had happened um, in the previous Bush administration, uh, uh, the Clinton administration uh, put in place the first executive order on environmental justice. I don't know if you went to this meeting, Trish, they had an environmental justice, EPA hosted a big meeting in Virginia. I don't know if it was like during this winter storm and everyone was there and it was so inspiring to think, oh, I could even do something also to address what had been long recognized was health inequities and in, in many different health outcomes, including what I had become more familiar with was uh, at the time was infant mortality. And so um, that's how I started, I don't know if I go on, but I just started my career and we worked on air pollution and I got um, inspired to work on um, toxic air contaminants. And I just, I want to also just note that not, it's when I got this award, so it's really awesome, but it's really not because just of me, but all the people I work with, like I work with you and I work with colleagues at EPA and I work with all my, my uh, colleagues and people at the program, Reproductive Health and the Environment and UCSF, and it, it really happens because we all do this together. And the work that we did, at, we started at EPA, which was really um, in response to the environmental justice work was to map all the air toxic concentrations in the United States for every census tract. So you can see who had higher exposures to toxic air contaminants, which if you thought about it at the time was both a little bit crazy and really important. <laughs> and, and I just, that is just some of the examples. Of it. Anyway, I'm going to let you go on, but that's why I wanted to do it is because we could like use data to identify who's most at risk and then to do something, to have that data be able to do something to help people and communities. Yeah, great. Um, being driven by data is always um, a mark of a great epidemiologist. And, and you focus on vulnerable populations and especially um, at the Program for Reproductive Health and the Environment, you focus on pregnant women and those um, thinking of starting a family um, and infancy and childhood as well. And I know that those are are definitely um, areas that this section focuses in on as well. So can you tell us a little bit more about the Program for Reproductive Health and the Environment and your research there? Yeah, sure. So there's another thing that we also got started back in the, the 90s was uh, the focus on, on children as a vulnerable life stage for exposure to environmental pollution, meaning that when you're exposed in childhood, because both because children have higher exposures, they have more contact with, with the you know, put their hands in their mouths, they have more contact with dust, they breathe more air per body weight, drink more per body weight. I was like, we say all this stuff now, like it's all just like, we probably could all recite it as a, you know, a theme or something. But at the time in the 90s, EPA did not really deal with children as a vulnerable population. Everything was, all the ways that EPA set their standards was mostly, I'm not gonna say exclusively, but high, mostly set to adults. And, and so the idea that children were more vulnerable was like this, new concept that got 
that really got uh, it started in the 1990s and then has grown since then. And and we, I was very interested because while we had done, we did great work on children, you have to move upstream to pregnancy because the fetal environment is very sensitive. Some people say exquisitely sensitive to perturbations that can influence child and even adult health. But at EPA, we didn't deal with pregnancy really. And I thought, well, you know, this is kind of the next, if we, we really have but if I'm not saying we've solved all joint environmental health problems, but we've done a lot of work in this area. But what about moving upstream and focusing on prenatal health? Because there we could even have more impact on, on uh, the chemical exposure. I just want to say that in part, if we use the science and set it and set our regulations or policies to address the most susceptible or vulnerable, whether it's pregnancy or those who are most highly exposed to chemicals, then we by default protect everybody. So that's kind of the, the overall end goal is to like really create policies and regulations that protect everybody. So, so that's what the program Reproductive Health is, does is it focuses on um, conducting science that is solution oriented, like where, what do we need to know in order to do a better job to protect the most vulnerable. So for example, one of the first pieces of work we did at when I was at UCSF was to, I, to basically use the data we had to identify what kinds of chemicals pregnant women were exposed to. So we know they're not exposed to one at a time. And we just used, we used federally available data through a contact I had because of colleagues at the National Center for Health Statistics to, care, to use federal data to characterize the fact that pregnant women are exposed to dozens of environmental chemicals, things like plasticizers and flame retardant chemicals and perfluorinated chemicals, which we know cross placenta and, and go to the fetus, and it's occurring during pregnancy. Like this was very novel to think about this in this way. There's this multitude of chemicals. So that's one thing. It's like, what's the science? And the second part is how we translate it to engage. We do a lot, a lot of work with clinical partners. So before I was at UCSF, the obstetrician and gynecologist community, we did this search and the papers were like, oh, maybe we can work with OBGYNs. They should care, right? Because that's what patients are. And then we go, we look and they had done one paper in their journals and it was on like flying in an airplane and whether you get enough radiation to affect your pregnancy, which it could be important. I'm not saying that, but I was like, well, this is a real opportunity. And because we were at UCSF and we went to Gage, we got, we, we, connected with the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. That's the biggest um, group in the United, you know, those, those are the, the professional society that works with OBGYNs, represents OBGYNs in the United States. We've also worked internationally with the OBGYN society and basically said, you should be engaged in this science. So if we can get the clinical community engaged on this who deal with women's health and particularly prenatal health, that will help move the needle both in education, clinical care, and they're great advocates for policy because people listen to doctors. So, yeah. and then finally, how do we make this happen in a pol in the policy setting? Sorry, I just went on and on. So, well, I think that you're using a lot of different elements to connect to systematic change, and right. uh, things have have also evolved a fair bit. So, you just had a paper published. Congratulations with uh, FIGO, which is the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Um, so this is going to be, I think, a really um, important paper. I think Max put it in the uh, chat for people to take a look at, um, talking about how climate change is jeopardizing women and children's health um, and human reproduction. And this ties together some of our main challenges of climate change, you know, fossil fuels and, and toxic chemicals as well. So can you talk a little bit about how these intersect? Yeah, sure. So the pa paper which just came out today, which is authored by FIGO, which as you said is an international organization that represents hundreds of thousands of women's health professionals globally from over 130 countries. What I really like about this statement is it is really the first uh, statement says that climate change is a reproductive justice issue. It's adversely impacting women's health and children's health and also uh, black and brown and indigenous communities and those communities it impacts are often those that are not contributing to the climate crisis so uh, countries who are in less resource countries so that's one really important thing and 
the other thing that the FIGO statement says is that it's this is a problem that requires a systemic solution that is most going to happen due to public policy change, including focusing on the contribution of fossil fuel. And finally, it talks about the link between fossil fuel and petrochemical production. So fossil fuel is, a com petrochemicals are com come from fossil fuel production and that contributes to a lot of these industrial chemicals that we're all exposed to. So PFAS, which is probably familiar because it's super prominent in the news, phthalates and other kinds of plastic chemicals. And so you know that plastics is a big problem in terms of both being exposed to the chemicals and also how it's you know, found everywhere on the planet and then other chemicals like flame retardant chemicals. So we have a real opportunity to kind of really move upstream and address these, you know, the sort of the source of these exposures to these chemicals that are contributing to many, well, many different health problems around the globe. Excellent. And I think with the timing, with the climate um, conference of the parties meeting coming right up, um, this mm -hmm. is very, um, very important work. Um, I'm going to just uh, pause and uh, look at Jenny to see if we are going to run out of time. No, you're perfectly fine on time. Excellent. I want to ask another question then before we turn um, a chance for, for others at the luncheon to ask some questions of Tracy. So uh, Tracy, you've devoted a lot of your career um, in public service and holding our government accountable, um, especially uh, getting our environmental laws to work at a systems level to protect health uh, and to, to strive for justice for vulnerable groups. And in 2016, when the Trump administration started to undermine how science is being used and started to really dismantle some of our scientific um, uh, institutions like the US EPA and, and other um, organizations, you put out a strong call to other scientists who don't usually get involved in policy um, and said, you know, come on, we gotta stand up and do something about this. And hundreds of scientists helped to answer that call, which I think really speaks to um, the commitment of the public health community, but also to your statue as statue as a leader. Um, and you helped many scientists to bring uh, data and science to EPA through public comment, uh, by serving on peer review boards, and also uh, by br bringing scientific information to the courts as well. So, can you reflect on what you've learned from this process? Well, I, first, I just want to say something about the role of science and policy. Science isn't, it's not the only, it's, I just want to be clear that it's not the deciding or only factor in making public policy. You need to have all these other influences, including on the ground activism to really make change. But science can be a tool that can enhance policy or be misused in public policy. And so I think one thing that's really, is this a couple of things. One is that it's, uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about this as a scientist, that I think it's really important for scientists to speak up about what their science says. So I'll just give you my example. I have been, all my training is from public universities. So I've been funded by the government completely for all, to learn all the things I know. And I think it's really important given the, and a lot of my grants come from the government. So I feel it's like my responsibility to give back by being public about what the science says, because you know the public and the government have invested so many resources in my learning or in your learning as a scientist. So I feel like it's a you know part of our responsibility to talk about our science and what it means. And then I think the other thing that's really important is, it, it, I think maybe the, Omega and Brenda might've mentioned this, but it's it takes a long time, the government is, Take is you know ponderous maybe is that's a good word oh, I can people think deliberate but how the science is used in decision making is very important it's also very technical um you and I know that because we spent many years at EPA and we know there's like lots of details in these papers and they can get manipulated um, in ways that are not favorable to the public's health. And so I think one thing that's really important is for us to be to, to go to be speaking in these venues to talk about what the science says. I mean, I'll give an example. Um, um, during the Trump administration, they proposed to um, undermine how epidemiology studies were used in, in their science assessments. 
and they put out a rulemaking that said that if we were really, if they were going to consider observational human studies, epidemiology studies, the, the data that was online, so basically the data that you go out and collect from your patients had to be made public. This is essentially what the rulemaking said, which of course would undermine our patient confidentiality issues and, and also create opportunities for, I'm going to say mischief by used by uh, people that are not, don't have the positive intent of the science. And so this was a, a really, dip, you know, there was a lot of work done to um, push back on this rule. APHA was a leader in this area. We participated. Uh, there's a lot of technicalities in the rule. So one of the areas that this is why we have our science response network. It's really important because not every science is going to understand how that technically these things are used in, in regulatory assessments, but we can provide that guidance. So we just provide a way to help nurture people's connection to that. Um, and I think it was, you know, the court remanded that basically court sent it back and said they couldn't do it. But Recently, EPA announced that they were going to withdraw the registration for chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos is a pesticide. It's long known to be a neurodevelopmental toxin. The Obama administration was going to deregister it, but then Trump came in and said, no, we're just going to leave it on the market. And so this administration did say they were going to deregister it, but they said they weren't going to make their decision based on the human epidemiological evidence, even though there was good studies, like including from Columbia. And they said, in part because they weren't going to make the underlying data available for people to look at. So you can see that the science transparency role is still having its insidious, you know, infiltration to some of these rulemaking. So it's really important that scientists like us get, you know, who have this on of can go and say, no, you have to use these studies. They're good studies. Here's how you use them. If you don't use them, you won't really protect the public's health. And that's where we feel that that's our goal is to help promote the best use and the best available science. Yeah, and I think that those struggles go on as um, Omega and, and Brenda had um, alluded to, that it's um, not one and done, uh, but an ongoing process for that. But you know, as people are entering the field, um, what's one of the key messages that you would give to public health professionals who are interested in science and policy and related to protecting people from harmful chemicals? What would you say to, to them? Well, I, I, you know, I was, I was thinking about this when I was on the and finished something. It's like, oh, it's like, it all seems so easy when you're sitting there and lovely Trish Komen is <laughs> interviewing you for this award. Well, I just want to say it's not First of all, you should just know your own values and what your goals are. That's really important because, you know, sometimes, you know, people will say things they'll like, they'll say things that are like, oh, well, I don't know, but th things that are not, will make you question your science or what you're trying to do. And so you just, it's really because we work in a field and this is true in the environmental justice component too, which is, you know, there's people who have valuable interests at stake and they will use a lot of tactics to try and, you know, undermine what we're trying to do. And so you just have to be very, it, it takes some confidence, but also I would suggest also, and so you just have to know kind of what your values are and where you're going. And sometimes, you know, you make mistakes and sometimes you think you might, you know, lose your job like that happened to me at EPA on that air toxic stuff a couple times. But, you know, but then you always should be connected to other people because your collaborators will help support you. People who are farther along in their career have been saved so many times, but people who were farther along in their career who helped me out when I thought, oh, that, that didn't go too well. <laughs> Maybe that's not going to be too good. So it's really important to work laterally and also with your, you know, more senior people in the field who've been around and can help support your work. And, and then I think just, you know, knowing that whatever your science, that what you know, you're an expert, you're way more expert than anybody. And it, you know, sometimes you'll be like the expert that's prominent and sometimes you'll just be a supporting expert and that's okay, so. Yeah, so I think that fits so well with our theme this year of, um, you know, social connectedness. Um, mm -hmm. that science is also a, a collaborative process. Yes. 
So um, I'm looking at Jenny to see if we have time to take a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah, All right. that would be great. Great, so if anyone um, from the audience would like to ask a question of Tracy, this is a great time to do it. All right, I'm not seeing a hand. I have a question. Great. Um, so it seems to me, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a scientist, uh, but it seems to me as somebody who's interested in the use of science and policy, that there has been some shift in the um, willingness and confidence of scientists to have a voice in policy making in recent years. Um, when I was studying, I, was, I, I did study some of this when I was in graduate school, like from, from an observer point of view, um, and the kind of professional risks that scientists uh, faced if they had a voice in a policy issue of being discredited, um, their science being treated as uh, biased in some way. It seems like there's a shift in that to some degree, but it also seems like science has become really politicized. So I wonder if you could reflect on that, having lived it and worked through it throughout your uh, career. Yeah, I, I know. I just want to just reflect on that because that it's, it, it does feel outside the science realm to go and talk about public policy. And I acknowledge that it, it can be scary. I mean, we've had this conversations at UCSF ourselves with younger scientists because you there's a this kind of narrative that's promoted that if you talk about the implications of your science that that somehow makes you biased but i i would promote this idea that i think that that narrative this narrative is also being promoted by people who maybe don't always want you to speak out about your science and it's a way to kind of pushed back on what you are saying. Um, I mean, I, when I was at EPA, <laughs> I always thought the one thing that people didn't like, is I participated in a lot of um, um, assessed, not just air pollution, but I uh, part of my job, I was a, a reviewer for risk assessments that EPA was doing and guidelines. And you know, people didn't like what you were saying. They would say you weren't a scientist. So, that is like code word that probably you are saying something that is uh, not something they don't want to do. So I think that that is really hard. I, um, but I just want to say that that you have to remember that that is often being told that is usually a reflection. Is sometimes a reflection of the fact that you're saying some kind of truth that is uncomfortable. And so I think that's one important element to remember about this. And, um, uh, and also, I just want to say, you know, in some ways, I'm very fortunate that at UCSF, because UCSF has a very, a university that is a very strong commitment to speaking out um, in science policy arenas and sharing your science as a public responsibility. Um, but so I think that's why it's really important to also be networked with other people. And I think during the last administration, it just became clear that you had that it, science can be manipulated or used or that there could be ways that uh, pol public policies could be put in place that would be anti-science. And that, you know, we it's just really important to stand up for, for this area. I mean, I think there's a lot of examples during COVID too, which we haven't really talked about, but it's also you know, really put a spotlight on how are we doing in public health and science? It's not it's an uneven report on that, I would say. So. Great. Raquel, I see your hand up. Thank you so much for all your work. And I would like to ask you, persistence was one of the words we said initially <laughs> was the, the quality of a leader. And I would like to ask you, what's your source of hope that allows you to be persistent? Source of hope. Yes. I like to say immovable object myself. That, that has been very helpful. Um, well, I think that, you know, I, I think that Omega and Brenda talked about this too. It's you, you kind of just, you, there's some 
element of this that's doing this because it's the right thing to do and you know that you should be doing it, but it's not always easy. So I would say um, you can see things changing. I mean, we certainly haven't addressed environmental justice in the United States, but I would say it was pretty amazing that the Biden-Harris administration made a, you know, a step up in their commitment to this and even have, you know, put out executive orders that talked about changing the fundamental ways that federal agencies do their decision making that should address health inequities and environmental justice. Now, whether that's, you know, how that's going to be implemented and carried out. I mean, I think what you see is he's kind of like the step forward and then we have to kind of move in to help make sure that they, they can fulfill those commitments. Um, so I think that, you know, the days that are terrible and you get that terrible score in your grant and <laughs> something doesn't go your way and somebody's left for president that you weren't too, you know, psyched about, you know, you just have to like kind of get up and like, because then there'll be other days where you have a great achievement and something happens that's really worthwhile. Some your people do some, you know, some something happens that, uh, <clears throat> you know, that they, that is equally good. The science transparency rule gets remanded by the courts and you, that's a great success. And that sort of remarks on the, you know, reflects the hard work that many, many people, including a American Public Health Association put in to stop that. So I don't know if that's helpful, but maybe you should have friends and, you know, <laughs> I like to tell jokes or watch Eric Andre's movie I like Ken I can recommend that movie Bad Trip enough. That'll make you inspired to think that every humanity is awesome. So thank you. <laughs> well, we've got time for just um, two very brief uh, responses to questions. I see Natalie and Vincent. So you're going to be our last two. Natalie? Yeah, yeah. No, I'll just really quickly. Mine is less of a question and just um, a, a, a comment, a thank you. Um, I will just say probably a decade ago, I participated in a program that Tracy was instrumental in getting off the ground, the REACH program that I wish still existed today. Um, but it was with community partners, um, Donnell Wilkins in Detroit and Trish, and um, just really value that you taught me as a student to just walk through the doors of EPA and this is, you know, the power map and this is how you make a policy ask because you don't get that training in life or in school necessarily. And so I just really appreciate it. And I will tell you to this day in my undergrad introduction environmental health course, students are required to write public comments. So we we walk through the federal register and I hold their hand and, and do exactly what you did for me. So thank you, thank you, thank you for um, the spillover effects are there, Tracy and Trish. Well, thank you, Natalie. And I just want to say about the government, the government works for you. That's what I keep telling myself, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it. So that's why you get to go there whenever you want and knock on their door, say work for you. Yeah, I remember going up the escalator and some people were a little bit intimidated uh, by, by entering. I know, but, but you me. have to, to do yeah, it and get over it. Boss. Yeah, right, <laughs> Vincent, you're next. Dr. Woodruff, first of all, thank you for all your contributions on, and your efforts. Um, my main concern is uh, I come from the environmental justice community and <clears throat> this feeling of being in the Petri dish continuously. When yeah. will science turn the corner and start becoming more solution driven versus you know information gathering i think and i yield thank you oh i so agree with you this is i think one of the problems with science is people always want to do more science which of course if you're a scientist you love science that's all great but if you're living someplace that's polluted there's enough science i think one of the things that we've been very dedicated to which is i'm not going to get into the details of the systematic review work but it's really like how do we use the science we have with thousands and thousands of papers we have plenty of papers and data to do some action. So I think one of the things that we try and do is focus on how do we help scientists support other groups like yourselves move to, we can actually do something about this. Um, so I, I agree with you. It's something we focus on a lot. It's, you know, scientists, it, it did the ways that you learn science are not the ways that decisions should work when you're in a public policy setting and trying to protect the public's health when they're already exposed to all these chemicals and some people are exposed to more you have to move faster so i agree with you and it's a process but if you have good ideas let us know great well 
I want to just wrap up with that. I think, Tracy, thank you so much for your many contributions to the field. Uh, congratulations on the award. Uh, we really appreciate all of your support for the health profession and our environmental justice um, communities. You do so much to inspire us to do our best work. So I think your, your last um, statement there that we it's time for action and time for uh, systems that protect everyone is an excellent way to, to wrap this up. And I'll, I'll leave the, the last words for you. Thank you. Oh, last words. Well, Trish, thank you. I just want to just again say this doesn't happen but with one person. It really happens because we work with people like yourself and all the people at, at this meeting and all my other colleagues. And I just really, it's, it's really, uh, I feel very fortunate that I get to do, uh, dedicate my career, my life to working on something that's important and fun and work with amazing people. So thank you. Great, thanks so much. Back to you, Jenny. Yeah, thank you both. Um, and yeah, once again, congratulations and thank you, Tracy. Um, and um, I would now like to take a moment and ask all of our uh, awardees to let me spotlight you together and take a Zoom photo because we're not able to be in person for me to hand you a plaque and take that kind of that photo. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna pull us all, pull you all together and do the Zoom photo. Uh... Okay, um, all righty. I'm gonna do a couple. So there's one and let me do, uh oh, I made a mistake on that one. Okay, one more time. <laughs> I'm not having the smoothest technical day today. Okay, there's one and let me do one more. Okay, uh, fantastic. Thank you all. Um, and congratulations to, to all of you, really much appreciated. Um, so we have one more thing to do today. Uh, and that is um, this year, uh, I wrap up my position as uh, chair of the environment section. It's been an interesting couple of years to serve in this role. Um, I'm not sure I did as smooth a job as uh, Justna certainly and, and many of our previous chairs. Um, I did the best I could under the circumstances. Um, but the next chair that you have coming in uh, to the section that we have coming in is an extraordinary person that I've gotten to know also over the last couple of years because she served as chair elect. And I am just absolutely thrilled to be handing over the reins to her. Um, I know that we're gonna be in good hands. I know that she has a lot of ideas coming in to the role and a lot of excitement to take the helm. So this, um, I have one more event that I'm responsible for today in my role as chair, and that's the social hour for those of us who are here in person. And I look forward to seeing any of you who are here in Denver at the social hour, but here in this moment, I want to officially hand over the reins of the section to Natalie Sampson um, and turn over the floor to Natalie. If I can. Thank you, her. thank you, Jenny. Um, and if folks, I did this before in the business meeting, but I think we should do it again. If people would unmute or um, use their reactions to, to cheer on Jenny for all the work that she's done these last few years. Um, thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you. Navigating us. Yay! We're in person. We're hybrid. We're we're all together. We're not. It is the social connectedness. And um, you should throw Jenny in the chat your um the the Spotify music playlist that we created this past weekend. So we asked folks um to share a song that either plays over and over again in their head or that inspires them or that they listen to while working on environmental issues so we're going to keep adding to that playlist um, because I do think we need to find a little joy right now and we need a little energy um, to keep us going so thank you for that I'll just say a few things and I'm sure you all want to get off zoom for a minute and use the restroom or get some food or whatever you need to do 
Um, but I will just share, um, we're going into the 150th year of APHA, right? 150, that's a long history. Um, do folks want to throw in the chat? If you don't, if you already know the answer, don't put it in there. But if you um, want to guess, how old is the environment section? What year did the environment section start at APHA? So APHA is 150 years old. Oh. Any guesses? 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 100 more. The first, right? 1980. So 1911, actually, um, but it wasn't the environment section. So this kind of goes to Tracy set this up nicely talking about this history of engineering and sanitation. It was actually referred to as the Committee on Sanitary Engineering in 1911. So you have that history. And I'm sharing this because I think we have, um, you know, we have to keep telling our story this next year in the years to come. And I can and tell you, so a few weeks ago, APHA asked, all of the sections to share some basic information about the history of their section as part of a history project. And um, going into the 150th year, this will be posted online. And so, you know, Jenny and Natasha and Raquel were busy working on programs and things for the annual meetings. They said, all right, I'll, I'll look into this. I'll see what I can do. And it was actually this really useful exercise for an incoming chair because I was I looked through all of the old policy statements that our section has written I looked at the list of all of our past presidents you know Josna, Megan, Jenny and say was was on that list too and I hope I'm not missing anyone else but I'm just really excited to build on you know the 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 years of work that have played out you know when you go back and you look at the early policy statements they're focused on um, the late 60s around air pollution and water pollution. And we've evolved so much in that the last few years we have an EJ policy statement, climate change and mental health. We're working on the, the COVID waste in EJ1 for those of you who were there this morning um, in the next few years. So I just, I'm really excited to do this work with you. Um, I think Jenny mentioned this this weekend. We always have a bunch of great ideas, but it really, um, I think the chair this is not my full-time job. I have a full-time job, but I want to support everyone who wants to get this work done. So I am hoping that you all step up um, and, and take on those leadership roles. If you're new to the section, you know, I'm happy to have conversations with you, but I'm just really excited to keep the advocacy piece and the environmental justice piece uh, front and center. So with that, I will wrap us up and I will, um, throw in a Google form if you do want to reach out and you're new to the section and you're trying to figure out where to plug in, um, feel free to, to fill that out. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to working with you all. Go take a break. <laughs> and again, congrats <laughs> to our awardees. Yay, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, Yay. yeah. Way Thanks, to go, Natalie. Natalie. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Natalie, for everything. Thanks, mm -hmm. Jenny. Thanks, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. you. And mm -hmm. thank you so much to our awardees. You've been, I've been so inspired today. It's just been extraordinary to hear from you. So, yeah. I would say you are my source of hope. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Natalie, quick question. Will you be emailing that form to us? I can. I'll send it out to the oh. section. I lost okay. who was saying that. Who was saying that? That was me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Shelly. Shelly. Yeah, I'm, I'm a new up. member. Yeah. I'm not sure if you have my email address, though. Um, yeah, why don't you throw it in the, the chat? chat. Okay. Yeah, so I can make sure you get it first. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, and congrats, Natalie. Thank you, thank Jenny. You. Yes, hey, yeah, Natalie, it's working with ma you. Natalie, make sure you uh, send the link for Omega's event at 4 o'clock. I like to tune into it because uh, we've been having problems getting on. So I, I appreciate know, it. I know. All right, I'll see what I can do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, take care, everyone. Bye. Congratulations, everyone. Take care. Okay, I put it on there, Natalie, for you, okay? Awesome. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah, have a good rest of your conference. Thanks, you all too. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Bye. it.